Hi, I'm Dr Cathy Hart, a GP partner at Affinity Care in Bradford. The topic for discussion for this panel was my success. It was a panel of women specifically to give voice to the successes that normally either fall by the wayside or that we simply absorb, rather than raise our voices to celebrate. The idea of a women's panel came to me in light of International Women's Day and the difficult week for women that followed. This included the Meghan Markle and Prince Harry interview with Oprah Winfrey and Piers Morgan's famously horrible response to it, which led to his being called out by his colleague Alex Beresford about his public bullying of Meghan and Piers storming off set and quitting his job. Sarah Everard was a young woman who was abducted and brutally murdered by an off-duty policeman. Her death led to an outpouring on social media from women sharing stories of when they felt unsafe due to behaviour, consciously and subconsciously, of men. Piers Morgan wasn't the only misogynist voice heard on social media that week, as many men followed suit with trolling of these women, either by disbelieving their stories or by victim shaming them. A peaceful vigil set up to mourn Sarah in peace was disrupted by the police and many women were pictured being manhandled and arrested. All in all, it has seemed to be a very challenging time to be a woman. Originally, I wanted to follow the LGBT plus heroes panel with one about famous and not so famous women heroes. However, my friend and colleague, Alistair Jones, who'd been on that LGBT plus panel, suggested that we celebrate the success of the women we know and work with and are friends with, who are very much heroes to those who know them. So I present to you our panel of Jude Faulkner, a patient services manager, Laura McCarthy, a salary GP and wellbeing lead, Sarah Humphrey, a GP partner as well as a GP with special interest in older people who works with Bradford Teaching Hospitals, Bradford and Craven CCG, Yorkshire and Humber Clinical Network and Bradford University, as well as being the Medical Director for Safeguarding, Patient Safety and Research for Affinity Care. And Sean, a salary GP, newly qualified during the COVID pandemic. Jude talked about her time helping to set up women's rugby teams in the 90s and having the privilege of being celebrated this year by the Yorkshire Rugby Union. A link is in the description. Laura discussed working out what success means to her and how she learned to embrace a new way of looking at herself and her personal achievements. She has helped others during the pandemic by sharing her wellbeing suggestions for home and work. I've linked to an article based on her top tips in the description. Sarah has so many hats that she wears and she discussed how the people in her life have supported her and how the opportunities she has taken has opened the way to more and more choices for her. I will put a link to her bio in the description so you can see just what amazing work she does. Sean reflected on the difficulties she has faced as a working mum undergoing training to be a GP whilst a pandemic rages and how through resilience she's not just a great GP but also how that has helped her in motherhood. She referenced a book she has been reading to help her children feel better with the strains they have encountered, especially during COVID. I'll put a link to that as well in the description. She mentions a few three-letter abbreviations regarding her GP training, and not everyone will know these terms, so I will explain what these mean in the description as well. These panellists and myself were joined by an audience including Mariam, Nicole, Mary, Vicky and Alistair, whose voices you will hear throughout asking questions and offering their own reflections on the issues raised. I found this a really uplifting evening and I felt privileged to be able to help celebrate these strong, amazing women that I work with day in and day out. I hope that you feel the same way. Welcome everybody to tonight's panel which is called My Success um, and it's a women's panel. This came to me really on the back of the interesting month that we've had, first of all, we had National Women's Day and we had Meghan Markle's interview, which was slated by many, many men across social media, famously Piers Morgan, and that led to him quitting his job. Uh, that same week, we also had uh, the case of Sarah Everard, where she was missing and then unfortunately found brutally murdered. Uh, the vigil that was to peacefully mourn for her was interrupted by police and there were quite a few cases of women being arrested and manhandled by the police at that point. Um, and today in the news, it's actually um, the reporter said that the police acted completely lawfully, uh, which I think we can debate. But it was a very difficult week that week for women. And I think it's a time where we want to reflect on how we as women uh, exist in this world, how we're allowed to exist and how we 
make ourselves present and how difficult that's been, but also how we've succeeded professionally and personally. Um, and I would love it uh, for some of my colleagues who I don't know so well and some of my colleagues I know very well to share their stories. So tonight's panel, we have Sarah, Jude, Laura and Sean talking a little bit about some of their successes. So first of all, we'll start with Jude. So please introduce yourself and tell us about your successes. I'm Jude, I think you all know me. Um, when I was at school, I absolutely hated sport. I was the fat one at the end of the row that was always picked last, whatever we were doing. And I just, I just didn't get sport and me did not get on at the school. So when I went away to university, my mum said, you will do something, won't you? You won't just sit around and drink and, you know, not do any exercise. I didn't have the best of relationships with my mum at that stage. And so I thought, yeah, I'll do some exercise. Went along to Freshers' Fair, bumped into somebody I knew who was on the women's rugby stand. So I thought, that's for me. That's what I want to do. And I joined the women's rugby team and I absolutely loved it. I played for eight years, four years at university. Um, and then when we left university, it's a case of, well, what are we going to do now? Because at that stage, that's, that's where women's rugby was. It was all within the universities and colleges. Um, I think Sheffield Uni was the, four, the 10th women's team in the UK so it was it was still very new and in its infancy we used to play at um, Headingley Rugby Club in Leeds um, they had a, a sevens tournament on Maybank holiday Monday every year and for three or four years they kind of invited Leeds and Sheffield women's teams along as an exhibition match um, between the semis and the final for a lot of drunken men to have a shout and leer at um, so we approached them and several other rugby clubs and said that we would like to set a women's team up. Now, from my point of view, I'd had a fabulous time playing rugby. I made lots of very good friends who I still see on a regular basis now. Um, I really enjoyed the game. I felt it was something that I would like, the, like other people to have the opportunity to do. And the only way that was going to happen was if we managed to move it into rugby clubs. Six friends and I went along to Headingley and approached the committee who are what um, what Will Carling would have called in the days of, of, of rugby going professional, a whole load of old farts. They were not interested in having women play, but they were interested in the fact that we put a lot of money over the bar. So providing we called ourselves ladies, they decided that they'll let us um, become part of the club, which we did, and I played there for four years. All sorts of interesting things that went on. So. I, I was fixture secretary and I was captain of the second team. Um, I had to organise the referees who were all coming from the Yorkshire RFU. Um, they weren't quite sure what to do when I turned around and said, you know, we don't want this ref coming anymore. He's touching all the women up. That, that wasn't something that they'd had to deal with in men's rugby before. So that was a bit of a, a shock to them. The reason that I wanted to bring this up is as part of um, International Women's Day this year, um, Yorkshire RFU have decided to recognise the women who played in the first ever Yorkshire, Lancashire um, county matches and to award us our caps for playing representative rugby. So I thought, oh, I've, I've been a success and I didn't even realise it. I frankly don't remember playing that game because I probably was too drunk afterwards. But, um, but I absolutely loved playing rugby. And a lot of my friends were involved in setting up the women's RFU. A lot of them have been recognised with MBEs for services to rugby um, and they're, they're people that you know I used to go drinking with and, and it's great now. So Sophie does, my daughter Sophie's 24, she plays rugby down in London, she has a fabulous social life off the back of it and I just feel it's a real success that something that was in its infancy when I got involved in it, um, it developed and grew and while I was only doing it for eight years I, it still has a big impact on my life and it's opened doors for other women to play a sport that I really enjoyed. So that was why I wanted to talk about that. Thank you ever so much, Jude. Does anyone have anything to say about that? That's a, a, a great story and a, a great thing to start the evening with. Jude, from all your wonderful storytelling there and such an amazing achievement, really, the bit that struck me, and, and I don't know if that's wrong, is that the bit where you said you had to raise concerns about this male coach. 
and that links in so much to what's coming out in schools at the moment and and what we're all up against and does it become an achievement because that's part of some of the difficulties that we face as women well it wasn't it wasn't the coach it was the referee um but yes absolutely that's the case and I, I, something i heard on the news just this evening is that um there's going to be a woman ref a woman referee in a first class um football match this coming weekend i think, can't remember if it's premiership or division division one or whatever i don't don't follow football because the ball's the wrong shape but um anyhow i thought that was really interesting that that you know that finally there's going to be a woman referee recognized in a in a match been women referees in rugby for quite some time now what I was wanting to achieve by getting involved in setting this club up was to give other women the opportunity to do something that I really enjoyed um, that was kind of my motivation behind getting involved with things like parkrun as well and I think that women do this an awful lot that, that we are doers that we make the opportunities for other people to go and do things and we just get on with it most of the time and don't make a song and dance about it I thought I'd make a bit of a song and dance about it well, I think that's a good point because, to be honest, that the the idea of successes was Alistair's idea, and, and thankfully he's joined us. But he was uh, he was saying, you know, we we should uh, enjoy and and publicise our successes. Um, Absolutely, thanks, Alistair. Good thinking. There were lots of uh, nods of the head when you were saying about how we should uh, how we should celebrate our successes, Mariam. Hi, um, Jude. Thank you for sharing your story with us. Two things I wanted to say. Firstly, what when you um, made the shout out for the referee, what was the consequence of that? So, well, he didn't come and referee us again. Right. OK, so that so, was a success, wasn't so, it? Well, it, it was a success to a certain degree in that he, he didn't he wasn't asked to come back. But whether anything was taken any further, whether there was any disciplinary action taken against him or not, I really don't know. Mm -hmm. Because we were really on, the only team he would ever have been asked to come and referee, so he just wasn't asked mm -hmm. to come and deal with us again. Mm -hmm. And I think the second thing I wanted to say is that if um, if one has been, uh, so that you've not been involved in sp sport throughout school or early university, um, a sport like rugby is something that one wouldn't feel sort of kind of frightened about starting de novo because it's quite unusual or would have been more unusual then for women, you know, to yeah. play, uh, isn't absolutely. it? So that's another win. So, yeah, that's great. Win. Well done. But the other thing with rugby, again, um, looking at the, there was an interview I saw with um, Nigel Owen, who's a recently retired international uh, rugby referee. He came out back in 2004, I think. And uh, he said that the rugby community around him was so supportive and it's such an inclusive kind of game. And you get people of all shapes and sizes and fitnesses taking part in the same teams. And it's, it's just a really, it was a good welcoming environment. Alice has got his hand up. Yeah, I was just gonna say one of them that my personal tutor is, I tutor at the university and one of them is in Farley and Medicine and she is a um, rugby player. Um, uh -huh. She plays for the women's team uh, for England. Oh, um, fantastic! It's really encouraging to see that the university have developed a a sports coaching support for for any any kind of student of of whatever they're studying, regardless of gender, to support them balance their sport and their university careers moving forward. So she's um you know in particular she echoes that you know rugby has always been incredibly inclusive um, yeah. she's managed to maintain her rugby until she unfortunately she smashed her knee in so it's encouraging that that hopefully you know sport in general is is becoming much less masculinized absolutely so sophie when she moved to london uh there was a call out from a, a club called belsize park where the partners of a lot of the male players said well we'd like to play as well and the club were really supportive and actively encouraging them to get a women's division set up um, and so as part of that club Sophie's had a pretty tough year as a member of that rugby club they've been able to provide her with counselling with physiotherapy with all sorts of things just because she's a member of that rugby club which I think is just fabulous and you know really incredible that it's, it's moved on that far in 30 years. I asked Jude, was she inspired to do rugby because of you or was it some other reason? I suspect because of me and because she knows so many of my friends enjoyed it. She went to a very rugby dominated school, but it was all the lads that played and not the girls. There wasn't really the opportunity for the girls to play. 
uh, girl sport at her school was you know, netball and she she never enjoyed it she didn't get on with it but the opportunity to do something that she thought she'd enjoy again has just opened all sorts of doors for her can I just say thank you ever so much Jude that was a really inspiring story and I'm so glad you finally got your caps wonderful now uh Laura are you okay to come up next I was really having a little think about how I define success and how that journey has perhaps changed over the years. And I used to have it very much an achievement focus. It was very career focused, you know, getting into medical school, passing this exam, finishing the top 5% of this, that and the other. But what I think my real success has been as a woman is redefining that in my head, perhaps over the last two years and, and really thinking about what success means to me and what makes me feel fulfilled in my life and and I know Kathy you'd sort of mentioned before as women we get on with all sorts of stuff and we don't make a fuss and we just crack on and do it and I think a lot of work-life balance and certainly emotional labor of domestic life and all those sorts of things we just crack on with in the background as well as all our professional capacity so I think my biggest success in improving my own mental health and sort of my well-being as a woman has been acknowledging the sheer amount of effort that I put in at home raising my child having another one spending time with my family and investing in my friends and really trying to lift up particularly my female friends who are struggling with their own burnout and their own well-being challenges and trying to empower people to acknowledge that work and accept how hard they work and sometimes demand a little bit more either perhaps from their partners or from their families and kind of readjusting that expectation um I am hand on heart someone who has a really severe case of human giver syndrome and I suspect almost everyone on this panel has it even if we don't know it in in its terms and Someone with human giver syndrome is someone who always puts other people's needs as a priority over their own, whatever they may be, whether it is time, energy, money, work. Most commonly people are in caring professions, so it does tend to be that way. And women, not exclusively, but are more commonly affected by this than men. And it's not always a negative thing, but I think learning to self-care and to look after yourself and, and build up your own energy levels so that then you do a better job at caring for others has been a big, big life lesson for me. Um, and something that probably took a bit of therapy to come to terms with. Um, so certainly for me, my success has been redefining what I would consider success, which is having a happy life that isn't necessarily defined by my career, but my career is part of that and trying to empower other people in conversations I have to, to really engage with that part of themselves and to acknowledge the hard work they put in beyond their career and not just define themselves as this list of achievements we all look at in professionality and acknowledge the other things we do as well. Thank you so much, Laura. I, I think that's really true and very insightful. And I think that you've done a, an amazing job for yourself. You've also been helping direct a lot of us, I think, as well. I suppose what we want or how we are, it, it isn't the same throughout our lives. As you say, there were different times when there were different goals and and things so I think one of the things probably being at a different age spectrum to you is that I've seen quite a lot of my uh, female friends and um, counterparts have lost themselves because of family not lost themselves but are bereft when their children have left home and actually their very essence of of who we are as you say givers and nurturers um, mm. has meant that actually they've really struggled. We all think that, goodness, wouldn't it be lovely if it was quiet, tidy, whatever it is. But actually when that happens, that's really very different if for a long time of your life you've been a nurturer and a giver and a, a parent and a mother. And you don't stop being a parent when they leave home, but it's it becomes, it's different. Probably when I talk about my story later, you aren't the same person throughout your life. You have different things that are important at different times. And there is no perfect solution or type of person, is, which um, everybody thinks there's some perfect balance and there isn't. The balance is not always in the centre at different times of your life. It just has to naturally flex 
because you have different priorities at different times, I think. And, her, and probably yours at the very moment is probably <laughs> very much around family, I suspect. <laughs> Yeah, it, it is, but it's not sort of exclusively about me, me thinking my, my success is, is just my family. It's it's just acknowledging some of those other things that are outside of perhaps my professionality or academia that I've never really given a lot of headspace to, but also acknowledging that me as a person is successful in the relationships that I have with others and looking after myself as a priority has become my success story. I think it's helped me take on more challenges. I would never have even dreamed of thinking about a partnership a couple of years ago because I just didn't have the headspace or the capacity or the energy to think about it. I was too spread everywhere doing everything. And I think refocusing on myself and working on myself a little bit has made me feel much more empowered to push that role and balance things a bit more at home. And at the same time, push through with some things at home I was putting off and yeah I totally get what you mean though Sarah because it, <laughs> it's different times of your life it's definitely different challenges and your energy focuses in different places for sure. I was reading something on Twitter and I think it was Muhammad Ali said that if you're the same person at 50 as you are at 20 then you've wasted 30 years. I'm greatly paraphrasing <laughs> but I think that that's true um, that I think we do change and adapt and alter and I think that's part of it our existence and I think as healthcare professionals it's almost ingrained in us that that's okay so already we're in that kind of forgiving place whereas if you're on a boardroom you're probably not encouraged to change and adapt and develop and you know self-reflect and things like that so I think we're in a very good job to begin with but you know, you've also got to have that self-awareness that it expands past the workplace. Laura, I just wanted to say, um, um, I'm sure you're aware, but I just wanted to say again, how very empowering it is for other women who might be struggling with um, similar things for you to stand there and say, look, I've been there, I've done it, and it's okay, and there's an answer, so thank you. That's the first thing. <clears throat> I am. <laughs> the other thing is, um, so what caused the transition? for you um what caused the shift in where you were and where you are now I think probably part of it was hitting a bit of burnout for definite and um, as most of you know obviously the the case that I went through and how I developed an interest in in well-being and healthcare well-being in general um but I, I think that was the kick for the transition was how I coped with that and the help I needed through that um and actually just having a little bit of professional help in re, re, just reframing my thinking a little bit. And, and it just became so abundantly clear. Um, and, and then you, you recognise things like that in others and, and try and find ways of helping where I think if someone had taken me to one side at some point at that stage and just been like, you know this was my experience I want to share it with you because it will get better but these are the things you have to do I think would have been really helpful I just want to say thank you as well Laura for sharing all through the year the well-being stuff that you have been doing oh thanks what I've learned this year is at times like I, I recognize one of my weaknesses is especially like at work is I take so much on my shoulders to the point that I can just get to the point where I just feel emotional and broken and then have a big outburst and rein it back in but you actually have taught me a little bit more to just touch base with myself um so yeah thank you for that oh you're very welcome I'm glad it's been been helpful Vicky I really am that's really yeah, nice I was I was going to say something similar Laura because obviously I feel like I'm a few years you know junior to you but I feel as though the help and support you've given me at Cowgill has been amazing and you've reached out and and offered you know lots of, of really really sound advice and and kind of sound not just clinical but also personal so I really appreciate all of that as well thanks Sean <laughs> and I, I'm just going to echo what these guys have said I think you put a phenomenal amount of work into the things that you're doing as part of the well-being for affinity and, and just thank you for for being there and doing it thanks huge <laughs> don't you know I'm you know I'm 38 weeks pregnant I'll just cry <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're all here. <laughs> I wanted to say that as someone who's known you for a very long time, that um, what I've seen over the past couple of years is, and I thank Disney for this in a lot of ways, is our mantra of just letting it the fuck go. 
So, like, the adult version of Elsa for you and, and me is as you've kind of found some of that confidence. And I, I, I hope that because you've been hopefully surrounded, especially in the workplace, by a good team of people, it's allowed you to build some more of that confidence as you. And, and that's been an actual um, joy to be part of. But, yeah, Elsa, we let it go yeah. on a regular basis. What would Elsa do? What would Elsa do? <laughs> Get it on a t-shirt. Oh, it's so true. Being part of, of certainly the the Sunnybank team and developing there has been incredibly helpful and empowering in building my confidence, particularly as a newly qualified GP and finding that balance. And actually, my colleagues sharing a lot of their stories about you know their first few years and finding that peace of mind I think we all struggle with in these early times and and becoming really qualified so yeah thanks guys. What I love about our workplace is in in awe of of the strong women that I work with and I think that that's definitely empowered me as a as a male and as a human being so I think hopefully that workplace and that environment with those women around you has, has maybe also just helped a little maybe. I think, Al, the strength for me has been um, the sharing of weaknesses and the sharing of our vulnerabilities. And I think that's been a new thing for me to see and helpful. I think that's true, isn't it? That you can only be successful if you know where you're unsuccessful. I think it's been nice that we have been able to share that because we we do get on so well. All of our colleagues, you know, across the board, I think we're all pretty open and honest and I think that that's been really useful thank you ever so much Laura for your your really personal reflection on your successes Sarah may I go to you next when Kathy asked if I would come to the panel I was quite sad I didn't get to um, I did listen to the LGBT um, podcast and I thought it was great and one of the things that I took away from it I was listening to some people talked about a story and where they how they got there and other people talked about the people that had influenced them to get there I suppose part of my story is probably um, thinking back to those people that influenced me and um, I'd say there were three people I come from a line of very sort of strong women in my family and my mother and grandmother are completely different people but they were both my mother, grandmother was an early generation doctor she was a GP back in early 1940s And my mum and gran are very different people, but um, they have heavily influenced. I'm the eldest of five children. And I remember Juju saying, you know, at times you didn't get on well with your mum and and we clashed. But at the same time, it's a very, um, very supportive relationship. And so they were two of the people that were really important. And the the other one is my husband, because my husband allows me to be the person I am. Neither of our professional careers meet the other ones Uh, they're both important and one of the things my mum always said to me is you never know what's going to happen in life as a woman we have tough lives it could be a bereavement it could be a divorce it could be financial ruin for all her daughters she wanted us to go away and be able to earn our own livings and ensure that if we had children we could bring them up whether there was a man on the scene or not we've all been lucky Our, our, our husbands are there and we're not financially alone but I think it's something that we all took away of the five of us. Uh, there's three girls and, and two boys. My sisters are all equally different parts of their lives. So my my younger sister, she's got three under four, four at one point. So you are at different points of your life. And and, and so those people are really the, the reason that I get to be the person I am. So my story started, I went to Leeds University. I was a trainee at Westcliff. So I was a, it was my first training post. Um, I then came back as a partner. It was a challenging place. Uh, a lot of quite powerful men and only one other female partner who had been the only female partner there before I got there, uh, Mary Cuthbert. So women in general practice had a very defined role of usually family planning. Luckily, I quite like that kind of thing. So that was all right. If you hate gynae, I don't know what you do as a female GP. but And that was your sort of role. And that's why we were brought into practice. But actually, as time went on, I went and worked at Shipley Hospital, which was a community hospital. And and, and one of the things I would say to other people is that opportunities breed other opportunities. So I'm not naturally somebody who goes out there and says, oh, right, I want to go and do that. Um, I need a nudge. 
Westcliff was very nudging in that respect of, you know, come on, what else are you going to do? Do I have to do something else? Yes, you do. Um, but those opportunities bred other opportunities. I've never been anything other than a part time in general practice because I needed I needed when my children were small to know that I didn't have to work full time and that I could choose what I did in the other time. If I wanted to do something else, that was very much my choice. And it's remained like that. So I'm now they call it portfolio GP, but I still do lots of other things. And all of the things have taken on from other things. So I got this role at the CCG, which was I was a sort of a champion for older people at the beginning because I worked in older people. And that was one of the things I did. And those things have grown. I now do a lot at the regional level and I do some national things for older people than dementia. And research is really weird for me because as a student and as a young doctor, I thought oh, research God, it takes so long for anything to happen. It's not really my kind of thing. But I think they said, all right, well, somebody's going to be the research leader at Westcliff. Oh, well, that can be you, Sarah. Oh, OK, fine. That's me then. Opportunities breed other opportunities. So so I support a few other sort of younger female GPs and doctors. And one of the things I say is, you know, it's at times of your life when you have to be flexible to yourself and your family, but also there is something very empowering about being able to do the things that interest you and being on those boards with other men and things. And you breed confidence. Nobody starts off super confident and ready to do all these things. I love the patients, but I tell you what, if I had patients five days a week, I would not love them at all. And I need something else. I need other things. And that means that when I do see the patients, I actually quite like them. And, and I want to do my best. But if I did that all the time, I would be burnt out. And I need some of those other things. But that's also difficult because you've got multiple people pulling you in multiple directions. And that means at times of your life, that's hard. My boys are both now at university. It doesn't always get easier, but it's, it, is, it is easier than A-levels and that kind of thing. As a working mum, I think our lives are really quite challenging because you always think you should be somewhere else. And one of the reasons why I decided I would always be part-time is that I can choose if, if I want to go to the school play. I suppose that's me. It's interesting when you talk about women in leadership, Kathy, before, because attributes that are seen in girls are bossiness, isn't it? Men are never called bossy. Women are called bossy, aren't they? That's a good sort of um, attribute to have as a man. And, and it is this interesting that we see some people, uh, women, our own women, sometimes see women who are strong as a threat, because it says, if I can't be like that person, am I am I the right person? Well, actually, I think we should celebrate all types of female success from beautiful women that we see in, on, in the movies to women who play sport um, and entertain us to those women who are prepared to be MPs and fight our cause and make sure that women's rights are heard. And we aren't all meant to be the same. I am not the same as my mum. I'm not the same as my granny. Neither of them are at all the same. I'm probably a mixture of the two of them. Um, my my mum thought being a GP was sort of a step down, really, because she's an anaesthetist and they work way harder than we do, apparently. But I think you have to celebrate all women, whether that's being at home or at work. Um, I think we all strive really hard. And you, as you say, give a lot, usually. Thank you ever so much, Sarah. That was a, a really good insight into your journey from trainee through to Westcliff, to, through to everything. And I've always wondered how you've had your fingers in so many pies, but as you say, one thing leads to another, to another, to another. Mary? Yeah, um, I just noticed there, Sarah, that you said when you joined Westcliff, it was very men empowered. But I remember when Thornton, we went out to tender and the Westcliff staff came through and it was very strong women that came to the meeting. It was all the women. And it was lovely. It was um, Mary Cuthbert, Julie Winterbottom, yeah. Ruth Stockwell, and yourself that stood out. Not the men, yourselves. So girl power there. <laughs> but, you know, and it were, it were, you know, to us, we'd gone through a really turbulent time at Thornton. And it was quite daunting that who was Westcliff initially. But the way the women there that met us and how you made us feel were just amazing. And just, you know, we were 
really lucky to have received the Westcliff girls. It wasn't just the men that were shining out there. That's all I want to say, really. It was the women that stood out for us. I think we got rid of them by then, almost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, that's very nice of you to say that. I must say, similar to what, with Laura, actually, Sarah, I, again, really value hearing women who I see as very strong and, and at the peak, you know, doing so well in their career and, and that I admire really. And sometimes I look at the female partners and think, this is not something that I could do. And it's really powerful to hear you describe your own weaknesses and your own challenges and how opportunities have come up and actually describing how you've evolved and, and how you've got where you are. Um, and I just think it's so important for our role models and for other for all the women in the group to, to share this because I think it's inspiring. I think you're right. As you do in the NHS, they love making you reapply for a job you've already got in management. They do this all the time. They disband things, redo it, make you a reapply. And at the end of one of the reapplying for something, right at the beginning, they said, they said to me afterwards, oh, you know, you're a bit reticent about your talents and 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 that's common with women and and, and I thought oh I didn't realize I was but you know women when there's a complaint we always go oh is it was it about me and the men go oh it can't be about me and I think because of that we don't see that we're equally as talented sometimes we don't think we can do it when you we absolutely probably the women around us would say you absolutely can but I think sometimes it's how can you do it on your terms because I couldn't give myself entirely sometimes you'll see that I do for days on end but I can't give myself entirely to general practice I couldn't be I couldn't do that and still be the mum who was there for the school plays and the A-levels and all those other kind of things but I think there's more opportunities as as, as there are more roles and more part-time roles it's my friend left medicine as an SHO into finance finance just doesn't do part-time female working you're either it or you're not whereas I think it's much more empowering as medicine as a career for women there's so many roles that you can do it's amazing and I still do it again even though it's stressful I wonder whether what you were saying Sarah about how you know when a complaint comes in men think oh it couldn't possibly be me um, and women automatically think, oh, it must be me. But I wonder whether men are being told it can't possibly be you. And they're kind of forced into a role as well that you can't accept that you're, you've you done mistakes or you can't accept that you're wrong. Or Do you know what I mean? I think it leads into that masculinity that Alistair was talking about earlier. But I wonder whether it's not necessarily that men don't think they're the one that's done the mistake. They just can't admit that they may be the one that's done the mistake because that's not what the, a man should do. I'm not sure I can speak on behalf of all of the men's. Is I do think it comes down to in, a more of an individual slant. I think my reaction for a complaint using this example would be, oh gosh, is that about me? But then I might very quickly not care about it and, and manage to box that off and not not overly worry about it. I've never associated that with my gender necessarily, but but maybe that's because it is accepted, but I've never put those things together. I don't know whether that's just me or whether that's a, a masculine thing or male thing. It is interesting because it's obviously a lot of the work that you're doing, Laura, and a lot of the sort of governancey stuff that I do is trying to say to people, mistakes happen, you know, all the time to everybody. And actually, that's just life. And I, I was involved in quite a, a case while I was oh, still an SHO that went to court. And, and, it, and I thought it's lived with me ever since that you just have to let go and bad stuff happens. If it didn't happen deliberately, you just have to be part of the restitution to whoever. And that's it's not about blame. And I think if you can get away from blame and work out, at, you know, how you support yourself, and the others around you and the patient who's probably had a really awful time and, and at the nugget of every complaint is some real probably good insights into stuff that has gone wrong and we stop blaming ourselves we probably would manage a lot better but I just think it's that natural thing when things go wrong it's like when you break something you, you know you're angry aren't you it's something you cared about or whatever and you just have to let that go don't you when you were saying women give I do think we tend to take on board all the problems and the woes of the world sometimes it's always our fault 
I uh, I wondered whether anyone had had a, a thought either when when you said Sarah about bossy and bossy being a word that's given to women and men are never called bossy. And um, I follow quite a few female MPs on Twitter, but I follow them because they've always put interesting things and reflections on things like safeguarding, domestic abuse, that sort of thing. They always put videos of men, uh, and I've got to say normally Tories, um, describing their language as emotional, as over the top, as strident, as um, uh, there was that case, wasn't there, of someone who said, why don't you mind your tone when you're talking to me, when it was about um, things like PPE and about frontline workers in the NHS. And they quite rightly put forward that they wouldn't say that to a man. They wouldn't call a man's tone emotional. And in all the cases, the women are very level speaking. They're not right, raising their voices at all. And they've, they've been called all these very emotive words. And I agree that I don't think men would get that thrown at them in the same way. And I just wonder whether any women here have kind of had to experience that. The way that we act is uh, seem different to, to the way that men would act in the same way. It was like Margaret Thatcher had to take down the level of tone of her voice, didn't she? Um, and was taught to speak so that actually she didn't sound like it was so high pitched that actually and whiny, you know, sort of that because... Shrill. Yeah, people wanted her to sound like a man, I presume. But I wouldn't want medicine to be only women. I'm quite sad that medical schools now don't value all of the people coming in in the same way. Women more naturally are able to pass the, the tests because we are those attributes they were looking for. But actually, medicine needs a mixed economy of people, doesn't it? What you said about... Um if you've experienced it, my biggest problem is that when I'm frustrated, and I feel if I was a man, this would come out differently. So Alistair, when you said you can't speak for all men, I have not ever seen one of my male colleagues cry. But when I'm frustrated, and I can't express my frustration, and if I start to get angry, I don't shout, I never shout. So what I do is I cry. And then people don't value what I'm saying. But actually, it's no different from if I was a man and was shouting. That's just the way that I'm expressing this uncomfortable emotion. My words still have value and meaning. But mm. the moment the tears come, that value is lost. I've had one of those moments. I remember being at a meeting, talking about something and being told that I was clearly very emotional about it. And it was just because I was frustrated and my, my voice wobbled. And uh, it was, uh, and then that made me more frustrated and more wobbly. But Laura. it's interesting, Cathy, because it is one of the reasons why I don't feel like I could take on a management role is because I would cry in the meetings. And that's not functional. I, d I don't think you would, Nicole. I think you are a, a very strong woman. I can always count on you um, to ask intelligent questions and always to push the boundary. And I think you, you don't come across as somebody overly emotional. I think when we care, we get emotional. And so somehow it's just about, I suppose, if you know you're gonna go into those situations, learning to manage them, but you get desensitized, so you're, you're all right. I always can count on you, Nicole. And, and I think you're phenomenal in what you do. I used to be a crier, but now I'm dead inside. So I don't <laughs> cry at all now. I just quietly seethe with rage. It's a whole new level of emotional control. Like a Vulcan. You know, Cathy, I don't, you know, when you have that odd wobble sometimes in your I voice, don't, I don't I... actually think it's bad. I remember sending a sick baby in and my voice obviously wobbled and I gave the mum a hug and everything. I'm feeling emotional now. Um, because I had young children and actually I don't think people mind that you're human. <laughs> and actually the odd wobble, if that's how we really feel inside, is actually better for people to know, isn't it? But I, I think it's good. I think there's a difference, though, between wobbling with a patient where someone's clearly unwell and yeah. wobbling in a, a meeting, like a board meeting or something. And I think that, as, as Nicole said, if you're in the context of a sick patient, that wobble actually has meaning yeah. and weight. But if you're in a board meeting, suddenly you've lost that. As you know, I read all sorts of stuff. Um, 
a lot about vulnerability and shame and society and how we function. And one of the things women are fundamentally not taught, but th there's certain assumptions about women and that is where we look, we should always try and look pretty and put together. I'm just saying this is society and we remain calm and anger or aggression is perceived as an extremely negative trait in women in every single capacity and it is not the same for men and like you say derogatory terms such as being emotional or unstable or aggressive is applied to women a lot it's also applied to women who are assertive particularly women of color it's it's you know being aggressive if you're assertive or you're confident it's, it's thrown back at you all the time and this is a way almost of it's like a like a glass ceiling like a lot of psychologists will look at this and say it's another manipulation that that men use without even realizing they're using it against you mm -hmm. um because it's not deemed acceptable for you to be angry or passionate about something you have to remain calm because that is your role and then um, a lot of the literature is very interesting that it's so subtle that like you say words like bossy are not applied to men they would be confident or assertive whereas it's quite frequently thrown at women especially young women <laughs> young, young women. women yeah how dare you be confident and assertive yeah. to have a point and challenge me i just wanted to say i think in our society definitely it's there but it's more a refined um, my husband is from Pakistan, so he, there's a lot happening in, uh, politically in Pakistan at the moment. There are a few prominent female politicians um, who are confident, aggressive, every sort of quality that the males uh, aspire to have, and they have, and it's thought to be powerful, seen as a good trait. But it's across all cultures, isn't it, as to how men treat women? I was just going to say that I think... Um exciting time that we're in now is to redefine this concept of a boardroom. I mean, the concept of a boardroom was developed by chauvinistic men in the 1950s in America. Like, who's to say that we shouldn't redefine a boardroom rules that say, you know, don't mistake my tears for sadness. I'm, I'm passionate. My tears mean passion. You know, we, we have the ability in 2021 to redefine these archaisms of society that so it, it reflects what we think and what our true beliefs are now, you know, that I think that's the exciting time that we live in. I couldn't agree more. Like vulnerability is strength, totally. You know, the more vulnerable we are with each other, the more intimately we know each other, relationships improve, trust improves, and therefore you elevate an organization. It, it, it's simple, simple psychological science. The more you trust one another, the more innovative you are, the more respectful you are the more helpful you are to each other and you work well whereas if you start with mistrust because you know nothing about one another or you're all too afraid to be vulnerable things don't move forward i imagine there's a layer of competition as well if you just see the achievement the next thing to get whereas if you see vulnerability in each other you're less likely to want to compete against each other in that way it's more about supporting and nurturing each other I just wanted to say I've, I've been reading a, an interesting book that a friend lent me for my children to, to try and um, help them through this year and, and Covid and things and it's really funny because a lot of the things that we're talking about it says in the, in the book not necessarily just for females but in terms of making sure that if they're they're crying that it's okay to do that and to tell them it's okay if they're angry however they want to express themselves there's a lot of positive things that are coming out of covid from from a mental health point of view as well for me trying to support my children but a lot of the things that we've talked about just then um is echoed in this book so hopefully it'll start at that generation and, and move through i think women set themselves against other women and i find it i find it really hard when I had my littlies, there was this book called um, The Contented Little Baby Book. My friends were obsessed by the timings of everything, whereas I was fairly free flow. And you see lots in the media about women who stay at home versus women who go to work, women who breastfeed and versus those women who don't. And they set themselves up against each other. And sometimes I think we don't even need to worry about competing with men because women are awful to each other you know, should you send your child to nursery or not? So when patients come in and ask, well, actually, a happy mum is probably the most important thing and however you're going to be. But I do worry that 
we set mostly the competition for everything is against other women it's not men what we wear and what we do is all about a lot of it is about our female friends not about about men so I think sometimes we there is something about maybe women being more supportive of each other actually so then, you say that because you know if a baby goes to nursery or is looked after at home it's not the dad that's criticized for that decision making it's whether the mum's at home or the mum's at work you know as you say breastfeeding or not breastfeeding obviously that is the mum's choice but it, it as you say all these choices are very much well the mum's made the choice therefore there's something deficient in the mum or or positive in the mum it's not ever a, a joint decision and the majority of these things would be joint decisions wouldn't they even even with my kids you know my first child you know it was a cesarean section wouldn't latch on wouldn't feed starving crying and I you know day three I think I was in tears just going oh my god I've broken my baby and my husband was like you know if you want to bottle feed it's absolutely fine there's nothing wrong with it whatsoever and I was like no no I've got to do it you know but at that point it would have been a joint decision if we'd wanted to do it or not and throughout the whole thing he's always been there but it would have been me it would have been seen as have you given up breastfeeding or are you bottle feeding are you doing this rather than as a couple I think women put so much pressure on themselves to be perfect you know to be the best possible mom to be the best at your profession to be the best daughter to be the best family member and all these sorts of things and all the women tap into all the women's insecurity to make themselves feel better. It's that classic, I'm going to tear you down because it helps me feel better about all the things I'm stressed out about. And I literally had a conversation with Alistair today about the mum groups on maternity leave and the different women you encounter and how they all cope and how judgy they can be of each other. But it, it all filters into this negativity or feeling like we're not doing our best and you, Sarah that book The Contented Baby I could have screamed all the way through my maternity leave and I had to keep reminding people that this book was written by an American where women have to go back to work at six weeks that's it that's all the mat leave you're entitled to so therefore establishing a really militant routine is survival it's not best practice and um, however we've got other options but you're absolutely right it was like who can get their baby to sleep through the fastest and who can get them to lose the least amount of weight in the first two weeks of life and you're thinking what is going on here people like just well, we'd, not. we'd go out we'd go out and what we'd have some babies feeding at 11 we'd eat then eat lunch and then there was another set of babies feeding at two o'clock we never actually did anything <laughs> so, but but you have to let people, you know, so my two friends absolutely swear by this book. And I was like, oh, OK, um, I didn't say anything, but it is interesting. I just think um, just being kind and realising when you get to teenagers, no teenagers are particularly nice. So actually, no mum does perfect teenagers from what I can see. Uh, and then you all get a bit more supportive of each other. <laughs> because actually you realize that actually you all need a bit of therapy except there's always somebody's child who does really well at school and never misses behaves and <laughs> so i think we're on to our last person so sean thank you so much for listening patiently to everyone else it's over to you thank you um yeah i was if i'm honest um quite nervous about coming on this evening because i didn't know what to expect but it's been really nice sitting and listening to everybody else's stories to get a bit of a, a feel for what what you kind of discuss and what 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 kind of is important i suppose just a bit about myself i cct'd in august 2020 not the year to pick to cct quite a few of you know me obviously because i trained at sunnybank but i'm now working as a salaried at cowgill so i've got a, a great team there and obviously i've still got quite a lot of support from sunnybank team so it's really nice to still have those feelers there and not completely be on my own i started off wanting to be a doctor at a very young age so i wanted to do that ever ever since i was five so i feel as though part of what i would say is my success story is really my resilience to carry that through. I certainly haven't had a conventional route through training. Um, as many of you know, I had all three of my lovely children on the, on the GP training scheme. Um, and that came with a lot of challenges, certainly kind of trying to, to juggle training, being a mum, um, my husband is also a, a, a medic and he spent quite a lot of 
time away training. So often, although we were together, um, you know, it felt very much as being a single mum some of the time and, and making a lot of decisions and kind of running a household. So it was it was quite a challenge. And I would say there were a few times where I actually questioned whether I was going to carry on in training. And I think certainly I would say there was a lot of support that kept me going. So I have a very supportive wider family, got a very strong role model with my mum, although she isn't kind of academic in any way. She she was very supportive of home life and, and actually retired early to kind of help look after my children so I could continue training. So I think although, you know, she, she didn't do anything academic, she's given me a lot uh, to look up to and a lot to, to kind of strive for. I've, I suppose, qualified in COVID. So that brought its own challenges because obviously as we do prepare for the CSA and you kind of spend a lot of your ST3, ST2 years kind of prepping yourself for that and then it was cancelled at the very last minute so I think I was meant to be four days um, after it was actually cancelled so that was quite hard, that that was a kind of a big knock because um, I had a nice supportive group that as you do you form your groups together um, and they the other people in the group were able to take their exam so it was kind of a bit a bit frustrating from my point of view. But then obviously they, they put out a, a kind of an exam at the last minute, the RCA, as we all know, and I'm sure is unfortunately going to be around for a little bit longer yet. But that was quite hard to prepare for because I didn't have a lot of time. And I had to, I suppose we've talked a lot about this, kind of find a balance between things at home, obviously things at work. Um, and I had a lot of kind of what I would call mummy guilt that I spent a long time preparing for these exams and having to put my children to one side a little bit, which was really tricky. And I, I found that very difficult. But yeah, I had a lot of support from the team at Sunnybank. Certainly, I think without, you know, kind of the push from them, I'm not sure I would have got through the RCA. Um, but luckily I did. And yeah, here I am. So I think for me, certainly I, my success story is definitely my resilience. To I had a, a I had a plan from an early age and as I say I've managed to follow that through and and here I am so the challenge now I suppose is how kind of what kind of a GP I want to continue to be and I feel like I've got quite a nice balance at the moment with kind of home and and, and kind of work life but it's nice to hear some of the stories from this evening especially from from Sarah and from yourself, Kathy and Laura, about how things naturally progress and how you pick up on things and you know you take opportunities when they arise. Because at the moment, I feel as though I'm definitely not in the position to be taking anything else on at the moment. But it's nice. I think I'll just obviously ride it out for the time being. Thank you so much. I've got to say, a lot of people on here have, have seen you grow through your role from being. Uh, a registrar through to being a GP but I, I said to you myself last week that I think you've soared and you've become an amazing GP and you know I think you should be so proud of everything that you've achieved you have done an amazing thing and to qualify in COVID I, I was also thinking about Vicky because of course Vicky's qualified as well and become an AMP through a really difficult time I think if I had had COVID as well at the same time of having to qualify and, you know, have kids and everything. I, I would have failed miserably. So well done, both of you, actually. Thanks, Sean. That was really candid and, and really lovely to hear that, you know, you feel things are moving the way you want to and you found that confidence because, you know, you've done exceptionally well. You really have. And to qualify in COVID, like Kathy said, I mean, well done, because it's just been <laughs> bedlam. And, and to kind of do all that prep for an exam that you then can't sit and then have to do a new system, as well as moving entirely to telephone consultations. And, and we've all had to adapt massively in our ways of working. And you've done that as well as qualifying. It, it's incredible. And it does show you how resilient you are. And, and then to move to a new practice, albeit part of our group and having some support, that's still your first year as a GP is really intimidating and and the same for Vicky you know that independent practice that you're doing the, the safety blanket feels like it's gone a little bit and and it you know this is a tough time to be doing it and you, like Kathy said you've done incredibly well you've really gone for it and I'm so delighted that you stuck it out and you stayed with us because 
Yeah, there were there were a few times. <laughs> we've all been there. We have all been there <laughs> without a pandemic to deal with. So you know, you've done really well, Sean. So well, well, thank you. I just wanted to say, Sean, how I said this to you the other day, but I, I'll say it again. You're doing amazingly well, and we're all really proud of you. But you know, sort of the the challenges that you've spoken of seem sort of. I'm sure they were difficult at the time, but you know what you have become as is an incredible doctor um so really really well done oh thank you Mariam. <laughs> it's really nice thank you yeah i think i think one of the things that um i just wanted to mention as well is the few times when i genuinely thought i'm not sure i can do this i'm i'm, I'm going to give up i think one of the things that i wanted to make sure is that i was presenting a nice a good role model to my girls because actually i wanted to show them no if you do fail things you know, if you do find things difficult, you don't give up, you keep going. And I wanted also, you know, so they looked up to me that they could think actually, you know, you can do these things. And, you know, my mummy can become a doctor, even though, you know, even though it's been difficult. Mm. So, yeah, I, th I think that that was a big drive and that kept me going. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say, Sean, completely different circumstances, because I wasn't trying to do all of the things that you're, you've done with the exams and so on. But from Sophie being three, her dad was away pretty much all the time. And it, it's hard work. And that was just with one child. So absolute hats off to you for, for getting through that in the first place without doing all of this on top. And, and you know, what you're saying of setting an example to your children, I, that just is fantastic. It's, I just really admire that. So so well done. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jude. I've got to say um, that leads on from what someone said earlier about your vulnerabilities help you become more successful in a way or at least understand your success better is that I think I've always tried to tell my kids where I've almost failed or where I've stumbled and how I've gone past it I didn't get my A-levels to get to medicine so I did a degree first and I'm just telling my kids you know you've got to keep trying mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter not everyone's born like the most intelligent, the most pretty, the most amazing. But actually, if you can keep trying and keep trying and keep trying, you're more likely to get there. And I think that that helps people. Like you were saying, Sean, it helps. Uh, and Nicole, you know, hearing other people's stories helps you realise that actually you're not doing too bad, you're doing okay, and you can achieve more. You know, you can achieve different or you can achieve whatever you want to achieve. On a professional level I've got to say I'm so glad that Sean and Vicky still work for Affinity because you're both amazing clinicians mm -hmm. and I know that I can trust when you guys have assessed someone I know that I can absolutely trust everything you do and know that that patient is in great hands and that's what we need in Affinity and thank you both of you. I just want to um I might as well share I think my daughter who is at, at university um has mentioned a few times how much she has valued having a mother who has worked in another in a job mm -hmm. um, and how sort of that has given her ambition and motivation and inspiration compared to her friends who have and I'm not in any way demeaning mums who stay at home of course not but I think seeing for her to have a mum who did do something else as well as being a you know a mum and did doing everything that mums do has definitely given her that push that she can also do something else so definitely I agree that's really important for for daughters and all children but I think especially for daughters I think it is also important like I've also told my kids that if they if they just want to work in Asda you know that's fine if they're happy with what they're doing it doesn't actually matter what they're doing but you can be anything you want you know and you could be a cleaner you could be a bin lady you could be you know an artist you could be anything um but it's what gives you happiness and I think that comes back to law and what what is success for you personally not a parent myself but I have to say my biggest supporters in life have to be my parents and my grandparents because mm. I I found school really hard I struggled at college never going to uni I was never going to do anything university related and whatever I chose to do they were just totally on my side and you know whatever I thought I could do that they were just yeah go for it and just the encouragement so yeah they're definitely 
people that have encouraged me and helped shape me to be what I am today. Thank you so much, Vicky. I want to say thank you ever so much to everyone for their very personal stories. Uh, Jude, I mean, I never knew you were a rugby player. Um, so thank you so much. The fact is that you've inspired other women and your own daughter to go into that. That's amazing. You know, we've had Sarah, who's become bedrock of Westcliff and then Affinity um, and has been a role model to so many women and men going through the Affinity Care journey. You know, we've had Laura, who's found her own success, but then helped to influence other people in how to be better carers for themselves, let alone for anyone else. And then we've had Sean, who's overcome so much and become an amazing GP uh, in a time of COVID, uh, as well as everyone in the audience who's obviously really strong people who have been so helpful and supportive to their colleagues. So thank you, everyone, for your input. I hope everyone's enjoyed it as much as I have. Thanks again to Jude, Sarah, Laura and Sean. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Nice to see you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Kathy. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Hi, it's Dr Hart again. Just to finish off, I thought I should let you know that since this recording, Laura McCarthy has had a healthy baby boy. We all wish her the best of luck and congratulations on her newest success. <laughs>